For the last 10 years, Ally Paranormal has traveled around Michigan to visit some of its most beautiful, historic, spiritual, and haunted locations. These locations help us to learn and appreciate Michigan's normal and paranormal history. We use every case to help with the next, to help us become better investigators, and still enjoy all the wonders that the state has to offer. In celebration of our 10-year anniversary, we have traveled far into the UP to one of Michigan's most enduring mysteries, where we try to unravel its secrets. Since the 1960s, a local ghost story began about the small valley in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. It soon became a legend of a train worker who died on the job, and his spirit is claimed to haunt the area by waving his lantern. It was a long eight hour drive from our area in the Lower Peninsula to our destination in Balding. After unpacking at our cabin, we went for our first look at the light's observation spot. Somebody comes riding through here. Somebody rides through here. Hey, wait, turn off. I thought I see something. I swear I see a little. Wait. Tiny white light for a second ago. Yeah, I can see it. You see it too? See red light. A lot of cars went by too. Those are car lights. You can plainly see those are car lights or tail lights. It's supposed to be a decent sized ball of light though, right? Uh huh. It's not just tiny little. Yeah. It was obvious to the naked eye that what we were seeing were car lights in the distance. They did not capture on camera, but we would capture them later. It did fill us with frustration after the long trip, making it almost feel pointless. So, we just went to take a look at the Paulding Light. The famous Paulding Light in Michigan's Upper Palantala. It's very obvious to us that it's car lights. Um... I'm a little confused and I'm a little concerned that other teams, investigators, and TV shows have come here and said that, hey, oh, hey, you know, we can't figure out what this is because it's very obvious what it is. I mean, car lights. Seriously? Car lights. She says the same thing. She's annoyed because it's so obvious. Come on, we both wear glasses. We could see that it was car lights. Investigator X says he's scared. Even this he's guy was realizing it was car lights. This guy, he's ready to believe. Even he says, yeah, that's total bullcrap. <laughs> Debunking tomorrow. It was rainy tonight, so we stopped. We were even out there with other people, and they were so convinced. They were convincing themselves the whole time we were sitting there. 
Oh. Do you see the lights? Look. They're changing colors. They're not changing colors. The car is changing direction. Okay. Oops. I'm pressing the wrong button. I'm so annoyed I'm pressing the wrong button. Despite the events of the first evening, we refocused our efforts the next day by examining the daytime environment of the falling light. The way to the next party car lights. <laughs> You can actually see it. The see what? Oh. The other side? In the distance, we can see old US 45, just to the north of us. An inclined road that seems to be at the same elevation as we are at the observation point. This could be the first clue into what causes the polluting light. The area of the polling light is nothing like we had envisioned before coming up here. The power lines follow almost perfectly to old 45. The area is highly used by hunters and ATVers. There are also a few scattered homes in the wooded areas. These are facts that are never mentioned by anyone who comes here to investigate. All of these are important factors. But most importantly, yet hardly acknowledged, is the other side of the valley where the polling light appears. We soon began to explore the north side of the valley. And we're noticing we're not even a quarter of the way down. We can't even see our vehicle anymore because of the incline. in kind of a flat V shape. You can see way down there at the end of the horizon that's where the guardrail is where people usually see the polling light from. That's the observation point. The point we're trying to make is no one ever sees it from the other side. The south side is a longer distance from the river at a gentler incline, while the north side is shorter with a steeper incline, giving the appearance that is the same distance in elevation. It isn't a huge difference, but it's enough to fool our eyes in the dark. Instead of looking across, you're actually looking down towards the river and the north side. Looking straight ahead gives you an almost perfect view to the trees to old 45. Until we can wash out and everything. This is the, the side of the paulding lake that nobody ever talks about. Yeah, see, nobody, nobody ever talks about it. Oh, look, there's just down here. ATV trail, nothing. Yeah, there's the guardrail. You can even hear the traffic over there, from here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you. What do they say it originates from? Down here maybe? It comes up? They're saying that it's somewhere in the middle. Which will probably be down here then. It's still funny, you can tell that this side here is way higher than that yeah. side there. The optical region of the land. Well, is there something manipulating the light and making it bend now too? Well, that's another factor. That could be something. some kind of weather phenomena, you yeah. know. Or, or it could be the, the EMF going because of the power lines. Yeah. Who knows? I will count this one. Uh, the highway sign. Oh, and that. not the tells. The what? The yeah, it's in the bag. 
that and the laser just in case we came back late and we decided to do it spur of the moment I was prepared because who knows what we're going to end up after <laughs> ally paranormal not afraid to go anywhere at any time even if some of us don't want to Our next stop is to check the view from the top of Bowl 45. Hopefully, it will support our theory. You can see straight down the line. Of it. Yeah, they have to go straight down straight, but now they can't see much. Well, there'll be a, there will be one way to check. I wait down there and you guys come up to the top of the hill and you start flashing the high beams. And if it happens, then there we go. I'll try from back here? Yeah. Oh, I see. Try it from the position. Until you, like if you drove up and down that part of it too, and if it kept happening while you are doing that, <laughs> With our plan set to go, we returned after dark to begin our attempt to prove our theory about the headlights. On our way to the observation point, we made another discovery about the area. We're not even at the official Paulding spot yet, but we can already see the... You can see it a lot better actually too. Yeah, it's a lot clearer. It's, it's even more dead on than it is at the uh, spot. It is trippy, huh? Yeah, it has you know. Yeah, it's... I think it has a lot to do with the, the way it's tricking our eyes. It looks cl like it's closer than what it actually is. I think it does it as getting closer. Oh, well, yeah, it's moving down the hill. Yeah. Well, we're closer to 45, so we'll be able to hear it. Oh, we already noticed when we were down on that end. Yeah, you could hear yeah. it really yeah. good. Just want to see how long this lasts. It does seem like that one's hanging there quite a bit, though. Look at how like, this like fades out. See, and there's the see turn. The see, it makes that sharp turn right there on the corner to go on to New 45. Hmm. Wow. And that has been your daily ally tip. <laughs> I was equipped with an EMF meter, thermometer, geophone, and digital recorder to monitor the area. I joined multiple observers on the cold Michigan evening. And I met a longtime observer who visited the light when he was a child. He gave me the story that he was told about the light years ago. I'm sure you heard the whole tale of the bridge washing out and the old conductor trying to stop it with the green and the red lantern because that's what they had back then, you know. But at the same time, I guess when you'd see the Paulding light happening here, up the road there used to be a mistress of his on the farm with a windmill. And every time you'd see the Paulding light, I guess the windmill would be spinning. Oh, hey, 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 what in the world? A story and, oh, uh, keep going. That's interesting. The EMF detector is going crazy. He's talking about it. But, uh, yeah, I guess every time he would be here, it was like kind of a lost love thing between the two. Yeah, that's um playing with the lights. I'm switching high beams on and off. Oh, oh 
hope they could see that. No, I uh, can't tell on camera. I'm playing with my laser. The light reacted just as we had predicted and backed up our belief that the light we were seeing was in fact car headlights. The night of our experiment, there wasn't much traffic and no reappearance of the light. The witness swore the light that we saw from the road was not the same light that he had seen before. Unfortunately, on all three nights, those were the only lights matching the Paulding Lights description. We sent Tom to a lower point in the north side where he couldn't see the light at all. Meaning that the light is from a higher angle and couldn't be in the valley as claimed. Attempt number three at recreating the Paulding Light. The conductor, the old train conductor with the lantern. Since Tom was the only old man we had, we sent him down there with the light. While we were recording, a second car had come from the south side road and caused a second lower light, giving us a second possible source for the Paulding light. If observers don't know that there is a road there in the dark, they could easily be mistaken. Well, there's a light over there's a car coming Yeah, there's around. a car, you know what? There, I see the lights. Yeah, you know what, that's coming down the other road. Closer one? Yeah, that's not up there. I think that's, I think that's on the other side. Now I can see it yeah, mm -hmm. on the camera. The strange look of the lights can be explained by atmospheric refraction. The layout and different altitudes of each point in the valley can be reasons for different air temperatures, making the lights look different from headlights during the warmer nights. The further we looked into it, the more we found to support the headlight theory. An internet search found other people who saw only car headlights, but there were plenty more claiming that it wasn't. The backlash against the headlight theory is substantial. No matter the evidence, people still believe that the light is ghostly. It was a disappointing conclusion that we reluctantly had to come to. In the end, we had high hopes, but we had to consider those lights debunked. However, it didn't end there. Over the three nights, we all witnessed things that we could not explain. Tom and I both saw smaller balls of light closer towards the river. We both also thought we saw a shadow figure walk across our field of view. Felicia and I both saw a light in the trees, but not down in the valley. I witnessed a weird mist forming next to me. Tom walked to the river in the dark and felt as though someone was next to him. I captured random EMF spikes. I just saw something down there. Yeah, like a little red light down there. Okay, Mr. Conductor, or whoever you are, I mean, if you're there, let me know it. It's what I'm here for. That first night we came out here, one of the guys is down there, and we're up here, directly up right here. There was something flashing in the trees. Really? Yeah. And the team team leader, she was saying, maybe somebody had a, a trail cam or something up there. I'm like, yeah, but they don't flash like that. They don't. It was just like a steady huh. flashing, and I'm like, what the hell is that? Caught your attention. Yeah, it caught my attention. Oh, 
another blink and I went in there. I don't know if that was another, uh, well, it couldn't have been a lightning bug. I don't think they're out right now. It's too cold. We thought, I thought I saw like, an actual white shape out here. Much of the things we witnessed happened off camera or happened too quickly to capture on camera. Our investigation can only be called inconclusive. We were unprepared for the things that we had encountered. The lights, though strange, are not unexplainable. But the other experiences we had cannot be ignored. One day we'll have to return with the full team to definitively prove if something paranormal truly is happening in Pauline.